Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to this plenary session. My name is Dan Rycroft. I'm part of the UEA organizing group. And uh, the focus for this session is uh, development and decolonization. And we're going to be guided through a series of very important and interesting provocations around these two key ideas by Professor Katie Gardner. Uh, the format of the session has changed slightly given the fact that uh, Dr. Jafari Allen can't be with us today. Uh, he's uh, amidst um, some difficult times uh, in relation to the hurricane. Nonetheless, I'd like to introduce him uh, because he's part of the dialogue uh, and I think will be part of our thoughts through the session also afterwards. Um, the, 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 the format will be around one and a half hours, divided in half between Katie's talk and uh, Dr. Luke Heslop's uh, discussion. And then we'll invite uh, comments and inputs uh, from everybody. So we'll base a discussion around those uh, and then uh, wind up at around half past three. So Dr. Allen uh, works on uh, the cultural politics of race. Uh, sexuality and gender in relation to black diasporas, black feminist and queer theory, as well as critical cultural studies. And he's uh, an important uh, writer who's developed uh, through or under the title The Decolonizing Generation uh, some important uh, ideas around how to move forward with this idea of decoloniality and decolonization. So I invite you to look at his work in current anthropology. His critical ethnography is called, forgive my pronunciation, Vencheramos, Sexuality, Gender, and Black Self-Making in Cuba. Dr. Luke Heslop is from LSE. He has done his doctoral research work in Sri Lanka, and he's uh, developed a series of ethnographic engagements that are coming together under the auspices of a monograph presently entitled In a Merchant's House. And since 2015, Luke has been working on an ERC-funded research project called Roads and the Politics of Thought. Roads as in travel rather than roads as in the, the person. Ethnographic approaches to infrastructure in South Asia. Katie Gardner spent a lot of time working at Sussex University and She's expert in the fields of ethnography and anthropology, as I'm sure many of you know. And her work focuses on issues of globalization, migration, and economic change, specifically in South Asia and Bangladesh, but also through the diaspora in the UK. So in terms of her book publications, you might want to look out for Global Migrants, Local Lives, as well as Anthropology Development and the Postmodern Challenge. And I think there's going to be a lot of feed on from that 1990s work into today's talk. And I think we're going to be inviting both a historical and also critical look at this uh, difficult relationship between development and decolonization. So, Professor Gardner, please join us. You're very welcome. Thank you very much, Dan. And before I start, I just want to thank the ASA um, conference committee for inviting me to give this talk, which is a great honour and a delight to, um, to give now. So, how should anthropology respond to what the blurb for this conference, SA19, refers to as global development agendas? Rather than answering this question directly, in this talk I'm going to offer some historical background to the relationship between anthropology and development some observations concerning what I think is a profound change to this, and some reflections over what we might think of as the shifting nature of the moral problem within the discipline. From being a despised other, I suggest that development has become increasingly embraced by anthropology, so much so that it is now frames our annual conference, albeit in a new language of sustainability and global challenges. In contrast, in the late 80s, early 90s, when I was a graduate student, it was largely a despised endeavour, and development anthropology a subfield given little intellectual or indeed moral credence. This position is analysed in James Ferguson's seminal 1997 paper, The Evil, the Evil Twin, which exemplifies this position of much of what we might think of as the mainstream. <clears throat> 
which I'm going to discuss later. I'm particularly interested in the evocation of evil within development, within this earlier discourse, and the underlying question of moral good. By posing the question, what happened next? In what follows, I would briefly update the story of this codependent, conflict, conflict-ridden relationship, situating it within the changing political economy of knowledge production, neoliberal corporatization, and audit culture in higher education, as well as profound transformations in the wider worlds in which we work. What I want to suggest is that there has been a fundamental shift in the location and nature of the moral problem within anthropology. Whilst up to the early 90s, development was an evil twin, closely related but distinctly other, with anthropology and its defense of people without history taking the moral high ground, it is now anthropology itself that has become morally problematic, with calls for the rethinking of epistemology, methods, and political commitments coming in a variety of interlinked forms. But perhaps most vividly and recently embodied in recent years by the decolonizing movements taking place in many British universities. Now, as we know, such calls aren't at all new. Assad et al's Anthropology in the Colonial Counter was obviously published in 1973. And the writing culture's crisis of representation played out over the 80s. However, I believe that the internal challenges we face within the day-to-day -day concerns of teaching and research which result from broader global changes and, of course, the conditions of 21st century higher education, at least in the UK, go to the heart of anthropology's methods and mission and represent a fundamental shift in how we think of the moral good. Rather than pushing development anthropology to the margins and defending the boundaries of the discipline, in the new moral order, anthropology is urged to own its troubled past, to open up, strive for greater diversity and engage directly with global problems. So what I'm going to do somewhat cheekily is I'm going to um, uh, kind of graft my new research interest in psychoanalytic couples counselling onto my analysis of the anthropology and development relationship. So, you know, bear with me. It might be a bit weird, but I'll see if I can get away with it. In my conclusion, I will suggest that we've reached a new phase in which rather than projecting the moral problem or evil onto development, we're facing up to the problems within. So before we get onto this, let me introduce the evil twin um, with homage to James Ferguson, who I know somewhere in the audience. After I'd completed my PhD at the LSE in 1990, I decided to leave academia and work in development, or rather the aid industry, by accepting a junior trainee post at the ODA, which is now DFID, the Department for International Development. For me, this, this meant using what I felt was my anthropological training to attempt to do good in the world, to make the world a better place. I was, however, really rapidly disabused of my belief that development, at least as constituted within um, the British governmental um, aid mission, could do much in the way to solve what are now coined global, global challenges. And though recognizing the good intentions of my anthropological colleagues within the organization, I became deeply uneasy at the unacknowledged power relations that structured it work, its work. It was not long before I'd returned to academia, um, and as um, Dan very kindly said, um, alongside my research on transnational migration and Bangladeshi committees and Bangladesh uh, communities in um, the UK, I've continued to write about this relationship between development and anthropology ever since. In taking these first forays into development, I was aware that I was stepping out of line, at least according to the predominant mood within my alma mater. As has been widely described, back then, the early 90s, development was seen as a sub-sub-field within the mainstream. An area of work left for those lacking the intellectual ability to deal with the real anthropological concerns of long-term ethnography and theory. Worse, it was morally suspect for the work of development contradicted the core anthropological ethic of cultural relativism. By calling for programs of improvement, value judgments about how things should be in the places where anthropologists worked were being made. And by actively pursuing policies and projects of change, development threatened the cultural wholeness of these communities and societies. So this position is brilliantly described in James Ferguson's 1997 paper, um, anthropology and its evil twin, development in the constitution of a discipline. In this paper, Ferguson argues that from the get-go, anthropology and development have been forged from the same base intellectual metal, 
Anthropology's antipathy towards development is thus not the result of its radical difference from or critique of it, but more their intimacy, for they share the same subject matter, less developed peoples. This stance can be traced to the 19th century, when in response to scientific racism, evolutionary anthropologists set out to show that rather than being different species, primitives were simply far less along the path of civilization. By the early 20th century, anthropologists had roundly refuted this view, with Boas, Malinowski, and others arguing that each society had to be understood on their own terms, rather than as stages on an evolutionary or developmental scale. Thus, whilst the idea of cultural relativism became a core value of the discipline, humankind was classified by those who were modern and those who went, the latter category being the objects of anthropological study. Whilst, as we know, anthropologists in this era did get involved with practical or applied questions on Malinowski's practical anthropology, for example, James Ferguson points out that the central practice and produce of the discipline, ethnography, refers to cultural or social wholes. Here, as soon as people step out of their bounded setting, the village, community, or tribe, they cease to be anthropologists anthropologi concerned. Little wonder that development, a practice which involves the spread of modernity, was so problematic. By the 60s and 70s, the independence of many colonised countries, plus neo-Marxist theories of wealth systems, dependency and capitalist penetration, led, of course, to a more polit politicised anthropology in which problems of underdevelopment became theoretically exciting and academically respectable. Here, development as a bureaucratic programme and form of governance instituted by aid agencies could be understood as linked to the spread of capitalism and continuation of colonial power relations. Ferguson describes this period as one in which, while some anthropologists became theoretically interested in processes of underdevelopment, those anthropologists who were working within development, who had experienced a brief flurry of interest from the aid industry in the 70s and 80s, became ever more marginalised from their academic counterparts. Swallowed up by bureaucracy inside the heart of the development beast, no longer engaging with anthropological theory and holding positions which were un intellectually untenable, they went for the quick problem-solving fix. Now, I think it's a bit unfortunate that feminist anthropology is ignored in Ferguson's paper, as here I do think there was a more productive and lively exchange between theory and practice, even if ultimately women's empowerment turned into yet another buzz and fuzzword. Leaving that aside, the point is that by the late 80s, 90s, although within the ODA differed the role of social development advisors, i.e. anthropologists, was expanding, mainstream anthropology remained distinctly sniffy about them, as I discovered when taking up my very junior post at the ODA in 91 and um, uh, hearing the responses of my supervisors at the LSE to this career move. As Ferguson concludes, the reason for anthropology's antagonism towards development can therefore be found within the history of the discipline, which, still influenced by evolutionary theory of the 19th century, remains the science of the less developed. Since anthropology is still largely defined by the places where ethnography is carried out, small, rural, and marginalized places in the third world, he argues, it continues to be defined by development or its absence. Ergo, development is at the heart of its constitution. Now, I'm going to read this very long quote. Um, I hope that's OK. Um, I think it's, a brilliantly, um, it's, it's brilliantly evocative. We are left then with a curious dual organization binding anthropology to its evil twin. The field that fetishizes the local, the autonomous, the traditional, locked in a strange, agonistic dance with the field that, through the magic of development, would destroy locality, autonomy, and tradition in the name of becoming modern. Anthropology is left with a distinct resentment to its evil twin development, but also with a certain intimacy and uneasy recognition of the disturbing, inverted resemblance. And this is the bit I really love. Like an unwanted ghost or an invited rel uninvited relative, Development continues to haunt the house of anthropology. Fundamentally disliked by a discipline that loves all things that development seeks to destroy, anthropology's evil twin remains too close to simply be kicked out. And further on, anthropology can't throw the evil twin out of the house because the twin remains a part of itself, if only in a repressed and ill-acknowledged way. Now, I'm fascinated by the imagery of a closely related evil other that is both different from and internal to the discipline and who refuses to leave. Within the theoretical tradition of psychoanalytic couples theory, which I've just started, 
why not? Um, <laughs> which I've just started to study as part of new work on counselling med and marriage mediation in Bangladesh and the UK. This would seem to me to be a classic case of projective identification, in which the faults of one partner are projected onto the other, who then carries the load. As the psychoanalyst Mary Morgan has argued in her theorization of couples' dynamics, by casting something emotionally difficult onto one's partner, what she calls the act of projective identification, one is able to keep it at a distance without completely banishing it. One half of the couple can thus be double-dosed with the problematic characteristic. Think of the couple, we all know such couples, in which one half does all the anger or emoting, whilst the other calmly takes the moral high ground. Is this what anthropology has done to development, at least in the earlier, earlier period? Double dose with evil, our other half remained close, despised but needed, resented but too familiar to be decisively dumped. Sleeping on the couch while we kept up a high-minded, dare I say it, sanctimonious sulk in the bedroom. I'll return to this analogy later. First, though, some updating. So in what follows, I'm going to sketch some of the changes that have taken place within anthropology's relationship to development in the last 25 years since the publication of this article. And since actually my, you know, really over the, the, the length of my career from uh, graduating with my PhD at the LSE in 1990 to um, now being at the LSE uh, in 2019. I should add that by development, because I know everybody's going to say, what do you mean by development? I'm talking about both the processes of econo economic change slash modernization, little diversion in Juliet Hart's classic formulation, and the big diversion of schemes of planned improvement. So this obviously encompasses a great deal, but perhaps it's precisely this imprecise nature of the term that has made it so easy to project things onto it, whether this be evil or indeed the moral good. So first, in terms of what's changed, number one, development is everywhere and nowhere. The first change to note is that the developed underdeveloped dualism described by Ferguson no longer stands, either empirically or theoretically. In 2019, development is everywhere and nowhere. We have roundly rejected the binary of tradition and modernity, showing both to be folk models worthy of study as such, but no more. An anthropologist hoping to research a group or community who exists in some primordial, holistically bounded, undeveloped state would be hard pressed to find anyone to study. Whether we like it or not, we are forced to engage with global interconnection, uh, change, and transformation. Now, whilst this economic change version of development, rather than the programs of improvement, this is that change that version. There can't be many, if any, departments left uh, anywhere in the world, really, in which analysing the spread of global capitalism and economic change is not central to the research agenda. Meanwhile, of course, since the 90s, transnationalism, migration and diaspora have become major areas of research. Anyone attempting to write a thesis which suggests that their people or community are not connected to wider global flows, markets or state processes does so at their peril. Whilst we still might be attached to our fuzzy term local, no longer does this necessarily mean undeveloped, although I do grant that it can mean marginalised. Coterminous with the ubiquity of development is its absence, at least if we understand development as a project for increased prosperity and human flourishing. In the age of austerity, growing inequality, environmental ca catastrophe, populism, etc., and the downward plunge of aspirations and expectations, we can no longer meaningfully divide the world into developed and underdeveloped. This has led to important work which focuses on austerity, neoliberal governance, and protest in what once might have been described as the so called developed world as well as studying up, producing ethnographies of corporations, high finance governance, and so forth. And this work, again, is now central to the research agendas of anthropology departments, and um, certainly at the LSE. So all this is a very far cry from the situation described by Ferguson, in which anthropologists at elite universities study in small, isolated, and rural places in the so-called third world. So secondly, development is theoretically relevant. Whilst the places where we work have changed, and with them the issues we focus on, 
Another important shift in anthropology's relationship to development has taken place since the 90s. This is that development, as, and, this, and this time I'm using the, the, the planned schemes of improvement um, definition of it, it has in itself become a fertile site of anthropological study. This is not in order to produce a checklist of what not to do's or policy interventions, but as part of a rich and vibrant body of work which contributes to theoretical debates that lie at the heart of the discipline. Arguably, you know, kicking off with James Ferguson's The Antipolitics Machine, which was published uh, as long ago as 1990. New understandings of discourse and assemblages, ethics and value, gift exchange, capitalist accumulation and policies performative are just some examples of these new directions. If what I have described above speaks to the movement of more adventurous and outward-facing anthropology into new areas of study, as well as collapsing boundaries between develop developing, or indeed a growing acknowledgement that global challenges are also local and domestic, an appreciation of the changing relationship between anthropology and development is not possible without understanding the larger political economy of knowledge production. In Britain, the discipline's apparent embrace of development, or more broadly global cha challenges, is intrinsically tied to two institutional behemoths, funding and audit. So let's start with the latter. The impact agenda with us in Britain since REF 2013 has had, dare I say it, a huge impact on academic anthropology. To be rated as a department which does world-leading research, anthropology departments now have to show that at least some of their work has measurable effects in the real world. I'm doing lots of this um, in parenthesis. For impact stories constitute 25% of a department's overall score. If at first, and I'm thinking back to 2013 when we were thinking this through um, at Sussex, where I was then, if at first this felt like a bureaucratic burden distracting us from the important work of producing proper research, my sense is that by 2019, creating impact has become increasingly accepted as a morally valuable exercise not something only parceled out to lowly applied anthropologists. Of course, impact isn't always to do with development, but what's significant is that the impact agenda has led heads of, department of, anthropolo heads of anthropology departments, such as myself, luckily I've just finished, but I was at LSE and before that at Sussex, to actively encourage colleagues to engage with the world beyond academia. The REF is just one part of the funding apparatus that keeps academic departments afloat. The second major factor considered in anthropology's changing relationship to development is research funding. As this has become increasingly scarce, sources such as the Global Challenges Research Fund and the ESLC DFID Fund for Poverty Alleviation are one of the few ways of funding anthropological research. Even the ESRC open call on new investigator grants involve writing a Pathways to Impact Plan as part of the proposal. So what this means is that the division between pure and applied anthropology has become increasingly blurred, at least in terms of funded research. Rather than the separation between academic anthropology and development anthropology, which Ferguson describes in the previous period, today they are increasingly fused. Put another way, we can't throw development out of the house of anthropology because we need it to pay the rent. Who owns the house, however? In the current era, I'm not sure if we can realistically talk of the house of anthropology, comforting as this sounds. Instead, anthropology is more like a long-term, long low-rent tenant who is just about tolerated by the landlord so long as she is prepared to share her rooms with a wealthier and more useful development. After all, we are housed within the ref bureaucracy with development studies with whom we share a panel. So who owns the house? The answer, in Britain at least, is that the house is owned by the corporate state nexus of the neoliberal age, managed by the MOOC University of privatised and zero hours contracts, service providers, students as fee payers and customers, academic precarity, managerialism and business plans. Sorry, that sounds a bit dreary, but um, hey. Beholden to audit derived league tables for student applications, to funding councils, corporate partnerships and donors for funding beyond student fees, and to the Office for Student Affairs for their very existence, we might think of the MOOC University as a property management agency, continually collecting the rents, filling out checklists, talking the talk and drumming up business. Anthropology and development thus remain closely entwined, 
but in radically different ways from the earlier period. Their closeness is still partly to do with a shared subject, framed more in terms of marginality and poverty today than so-called underdeveloped. It is also partly a little recognised shared moral imperative to do good, because I, I suggest that most anthropologists are also motivated by a sense that their profession contributes to the greater good, just as those working in development. But most important, the intimacy between anthropology and development is derived from the wider systems from which both fields of study and action have been constituted. In the current context, this is part of a world order of austerity and neoliberalism, in which both higher education and development have had core funding, core funding cut and are forced via regimes of audit and public accountability to justify their existence. But finally, there is another even more important reason why development and anthropology are closely related. This is that their ancestry, ancestry is the same, colonialism. This returns me to the theme of moral value, both outside and within anthropology. So whilst in many ways the discipline is thriving, I think we currently face a number of interconnecting problems which are unlikely to go away anytime soon. Indeed, I suggest we're currently experiencing something of a moral crisis no longer projecting evil onto our partner development, but instead finally turning inwards and recognising it within ourselves. This is partly because development has changed, morphing into global challenges and acquiring attractive add-ons such as sustainability. It is also because, as I've just described, there are institutional and pragmatic reasons why we have to remain bedfellows. As I mentioned earlier, it's hard to truly hate one's partner if they pay the rent. But more profoundly, I think that rather than purporting to be morally better than our evil twin or our partner, we're starting to own up to our own troubles. This is evidenced by the various panels at this conference that focus on a series of interconnecting issues involving um, various problems. So I don't want to take up too much time, but I'm just going to run quickly through this a sort of summary, if you like, of what I think some of the things that we're really grappling with at the moment are. Anthropology, first race and colonialism, and, and uh, of course I know these are much rehearsed and I'm not, um, I'm not inventing anything here. Anthropology remains a predominantly white and middle-class discipline, at least in terms of those who gain PhDs and academic posts. There are complex reasons for this, but a contributing factor is what we think of as our canon, how we teach it, and the messages we're giving out as to what anthropology is and who it is for. Now, issues of race are not simply about inclusivity in terms of staff and student bodies, vital though these are, but far-reaching questions surrounding the relationship between knowledge and power and the discipline's colonial heritage. So, obviously, these questions have been around a very long time, and there have been many important interventions and changes. But I think, in, um, in many ways, I think, at least... The UK and some of the um, main, what we might think of as the mainstream has yet to fully come to terms with the far-reaching nature of these problems. Secondly, conditions of employment, exploitation of the, of the academic precariat. There have been a number of panels and workshops and articles have recently raised the issue of the vulnerability of junior researchers in large projects funded by senior PIs. Questions of the ownership of ethnographic material, new forms of anthropology, um, armchair anthropology is central. More generally, the lack of permanent posts has led to desperate insecurity amongst young postdoctoral anthropologists, a situation which the seniors bemoan but feel unable to change. These problems arise in part from the broader context of higher education, the pressures on individuals and departments to gain superstar grants, and limited resources for hiring new, new faculty. But again, in order to address them, we need to develop new codes of research ethics work which is um, already beginning. A recent article by Ed Simpson asks if anthropology is legal and alarmingly concludes that it isn't. As the world becomes interconnected and digitalised, what we write is increasingly objected to by our inter interlocutors. Since anthropological evidence is unlikely to stand up in court, if the objectors pursue legal routes, our work is in danger of becoming censored. As David Moss has put it, the desk has collapsed into the field, and I note that this is the subject of uh, some panels here, making the classic separation of fieldwork and writing up increasingly problematic. So all of these problems are related to a profound underlying question. Again, this has been a long time, but it's one I think we are only now starting to properly engage with. 
To what extent do our core methods and pedagogy unconsciously replicate the colonial practices of our forefathers? And from this is an equally pressing question. How might they be transformed? So, finally. So to conclude, and without wishing to overly labour my psychoanalytic metaphor, rather than squabbling with development, I suggest we are finally taking our place on the psychoanalytic couch in order to work through our troubled past and the ways our colonial parentage has, to cite Philip Larkin, fucked us up. In my view, the decolonising movements taking place within various UK departments offer us an opportunity to do this. Indeed, and I'm borrowing from Anne Stoller's lovely lecture last night, just as colonialism is as much about the future as it is the past, so is decolonising. So in our discussions with student-led de the student-led decolonising campaign of the LSE this year, what has been striking is that whilst anthropology's heritage and the heritage of the department was a jumping off point for the campaign, it's the present and a desired future that matters the most to our students, particularly in terms of pedagogy and inclusivity. Here, decolonising and the internal self-reflective work that it demands of us is an act of hope, an attempt to make anthropology and its practices morally good in a world where so much else is bad. And so, in my brief history of the relationship between anthropology and development, perhaps we finally have a resolution. Sharing our rented rooms, we need to accept that we can never really get away from development. But in the future, perhaps anthropology can continue to open up, reflect and change. Instead of putting up defences, drawing strong boundaries around the discipline or harking back to an ill-understood past, what Freud would have termed fantasy, by exploring the evil within, understanding our own problematic patterns of behaviour and where they've come from, and then actively changing them, we might be better equipped to open up, reach out, and face the world around us with all its global challenges. Thank you very much, Katie. Excellent. Now I invite Luke Heslock for his discussion points, and then we'll open up questions and discussion after that. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Kitty, and thanks to uh, Emma and Dan for inviting me uh, here today. I've, um, so I was asked initially to be a discussant on uh, two of the papers on uh, anthropology and development and the uh, and anthropology and the decolonisation uh, movements, respectively. Uh, but unfortunately, with uh, Professor Allen's unavoidable absence, I'm going to try and kind of um, touch, sort of move along the same discussion trajectory um, and touch on some of the things that Professor Allen may have brought up. But having said that, um, I can, of course, not speak at all with the same uh, or authority and experience, all from the same vantage point. Um, but I'll, I'll try and touch on some of this as we go. So, read as a rejoinder to Ferguson's chapter in History and the Politics of Knowledge on the anthropology, um, on anthropology and its so-called evil, evil twin, Katie's paper makes an incredibly valuable intervention by outlining and updating the relationship status of anthropology and development in the era of financialized neoliberal university uh, and having gone through a, a solid round of debunking unworkable binaries of uh, tradition and modernity, uh, as well as feminist interventions in both anthropology and development, uh, about which it would, uh, it would be very good to actually hear more uh, than the paper currently uh, offers on this. Uh, and an environment of austerity and audit. The implication of the former perhaps being that as departmental belts are tightened, uh, we might see a surge in, uh, of slightly less sniffy entrance into the Anth and Dev uh, nexus. Uh, so one of the key messages from Ferguson's paper here uh, is that, quite frankly, anthropologists... Um, oh, sorry, I just lost my bit. Quite frankly, sorry, anthropologists in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. Uh, a, word, a world with uh, development split between uh, more and less and yet-to-be-developed people has been constitutive of the anthropological project as much as has guided development practice uh, over the 20th century. Katie's paper offers a great deal for critical reflection 
particularly when it comes to considering anthropology's equally troubling relationship with colonialism and its contemporary role in the decolonizing movement. Both uh, Gardner and Ferguson acknowledge here, how, uh, here, however, that even in its critique of development, anthropology is wrestling, by and large, with a problem uh, of its own. That is, the problem of, ostens of, an, of an ostensibly liberal discipline to become coeval with its own somewhat uncomfortable intellectual, social and political biography. Professor Gardner is, is of course, in my opinion, quite right to challenge Ferguson's depiction of anthropology sharing an interest with bounded locales uh, and so-called lesser developed people, uh, as is well documented, as, as was, sorry, well documented in the paper, uh, anthropology and anthropological research trajectories have come a long way in the last 22 years. Katie presents development, uh, the, the development twin, not as some slightly distant other, uh, but rather more directly as a projection of the self conveniently transferring its moral shortfalls to another discipline. She invites us to see a brave new anthropology, hyper-reflexive, an urge to own its own troubled past in a new moral order. However, to take ownership of a troubled past is itself uh, not a clear or simple task and raises questions of whose past and whose ownership. If the genetic intimacy between anthropology and development makes them so entwined, much to the chagrin of the uh, anthro-intellectual purist, are anthropology departments appropriate or effective spaces from which to launch decolonizing movements at all? The metaphor of an antagonist house share between anthropology and development utilized by Ferguson in the mid-90s and uh, Katie today, uh, notably a shared habitation in which development always replaces the milk and anthropology never empties the bin, perhaps seems apt. Yet both occupier and owner in the household are haunted, not necessarily by each other, as, as, as Katie has described, but by the ghosts and demons of their colonial disciplinary origins. Talk of haunted houses coupled with the notion of projective identification that Katie has borrowed from therapeutic psychology brings to my mind Gananath Obisekara's Freudian interpretation of spirit possession in Sri Lanka, as presented in his book Medusa's Hair. I'm sure it was on the tip of everyone's tongue. Here, Obisekara presents uh, narratives of possession and healing through the lives of analysis, uh, uh, through the lives of religious ecstatics on whom the book is based, and similarly marries this with his own analysis of, uh, of, of psychoanalytic theory. Now stay with me, uh, uh, to, to quote Katie, obscure though this reference may seem. Anthropology, it seems, remains possessed by the violent colonial history of empire, a predicament that, for a number of reasons, has fallen into sharp relief at this particular political moment and forced to reckon with its own biography. At this particular juncture, two salient factors emerge from obvious Acre's work that speak to the predicament of exercising colonialism from anthropology. Firstly, while self-reflection and self-understanding can be seen as a therapeutic goal of psychoanalysis, these are important but not ultimate stages in the therapeutic process of the possessed. For anthropology, as with, possess, as with the possessed, self-understanding and hyper-reflexivity, though important, is not the end of the story nor the source of the cure. While it may be within our institutional arsenal to pack historically reflexive critique into our introduction to anthropology courses, understanding the relationship between the discipline's colonial past and the way coloniality continues to permeate the discipline is not the same as being decolonized. Recognizing the roots of contemporary racism in the multiple material, political, and social and cultural processes of colonialism, or recognizing a troubled past, is arguably better than insulating oneself, but still only part of some larger reworking of the social context. In other words, the praxis of decolonizing is, of course, much broader than the reflexive disciplinary self-understanding. Secondly, the reckoning of the affliction in possession, as with decolonizing a discipline, may have to be relentlessly public. This may mean 
that, decolonial that the decolonization of anthropology will not come from within its established professional fraternity. The public claims will have to be made on the discipline before that public claim, so will have to be made on the discipline before action is taken. Action that is of a structural nature. And that anthropology will itself become a more public discipline, and not necessarily on the kind of auditable impact terms uh, that established in institutions prefer. If the enduring spirit of the colonial past can't be ex exercised, a slightly more provocative question perhaps needs to be asked. Should we burn the house down? In the words of Jafari Allen, we must abandon a concept of anthropology that centers on what it offers that sociology, history, economics, or political science does not, in favor of one that details what it specifically can offer to a broader collaborative repertoire. I wonder if the challenge is, the challenge is for anthropology to deal with its problems without being myopic and offensive, and therefore to show how it is productive. This is often easier to do with development in some ways than it is with ostensibly, problematically, more, more theoretical social anthropology. There's an, observ an observable asymmetry. <laughs> there is an observable asymmetry in all of this, whereby some of the most obvious claims of racism and the closest links to the colonial project can be laid at the door of the anthropology department. Yet faculties themselves are often filled with self-identifying anti-racism advocates, if not engaged anti-racism activists. Disheartening for anthropologists so inclined is that their own departments may not be the space where transformation happens. In particular, perhaps, if anthropology remains in a codependent relationship with development. Though a nod to the position of the UK university sitting within the broader circuits of power, the McGee University model of higher education, often refer referred to as the neoliberal university, as kind of a property management agency, as much as I like the analogy for its cynical reach, doesn't quite, for me, capture the university as depicted by the decolonized movement as a, as a structurally entrenched site uh, that, to quote Shilliam, seek to prefer, pre seeks to preserve the whiteness of elite cultural production. In the public presentation of anthropology dealing with its past, notably the renaming of things, rooms and wings, etc., what might be referred to as the footnote model has emerged popular, whereby you keep the picture of the founding fathers of the discipline, rooms filled with austere white faces, but place next to them a footnote to say, for example, Evans Pritchard spied on the Nure for the British colonial authorities, or that Charles Sel Seligman uh, was a staunch proponent of the hematic theory, which depicted most, if not all, of so-called civilised technological and cultural developments in Africa coming from pastoral Europeans. With every Leverhulme-funded project, uh, every, sorry, with every Leverhulme-funded research project or article celebrated in anthropology departments across the UK, should we footnote that the research was funded through wealth amassed by Lord Leverhulme, aka Unilever, and slave labour in palm oil plantations in the Congo under the brutal regime of King Leopold? Or should we perhaps keep it to assure this research was funded by colonial atrocity in Africa? Enter stage right a £25 billion UK government fund, the Global Challenges Research Fund. Here, under the Network Plus scheme at least, one with which I myself have recently become more familiar with, academics apply through university research offices and, if successful, act as a kind of fund to which overseas organisations can apply to implement the research. In this configuration, development, specifically DFID, Uh, the, the Department of International Development, to return to Katie's house-sharing analogy, directly pays the rent for anthropologists lucky enough to swim in that income stream. In return, DFID has a hand in setting a global research agenda for local partners, and the government can channel overseas development assistance through UK universities. Such agenda, set, such agenda setting could perhaps also be read here as colonising the relations of knowledge production and feels a far cry from a social project for the anthropology of liberation and the politics and ethics uh, of funding, I believe will be, continue to be a challenge for us. Now, 
Returning to Aubrey Sacre's uh, ascetics uh, momentarily in closing, what is particularly central to the ritual healing process following possession uh, is the, capac the capacity of the afflicted to tell a better story about the social context they find themselves in, a story of self-knowledge that's publicly sanctioned. Perhaps, however, this is where we might depart from the analogy of possession. If anthropology and development sees the challenge ahead as telling a more detailed story about itself, or indeed one with more footnotes, then this will be to the detriment of the much needed laborious and often slow work of structural change of the sort uh, outlined, outlined by Katie Gardner and Jafari Allen and many of our students. Thank you, that's my... <laughs> Thank you so much, Luke. I'm sure many of you have a lot of questions in mind. Uh, do we have a mic? Yes, we do. Uh, please raise your hands. And when you bring your question, please say who you are. Any questions? So there's one in the middle and one at the back. Should we start over here on the left? Hello. Um, thank you very much. That was um, really interesting to listen, especially nowadays while um, thinking about development for me. I um, did my PhD uh, on gender and development. And, um, well, my name is Zeynep. I'm, I'm coming from Berlin. Um, and um, if I would, I would take the same analogy, then I would rather say that, well, um, critique uh, coming from anthropology directed towards development was not heard and it was for a very long time was not heard so um, in the end uh, in fact anthropology just uh, left development or they are simply divorced and soon after there's a there's a new partner for anthropology which would be humanitarianism and it didn't it didn't uh, really last long either so um, um, well, there are now, there's this uh, triangle, bizarre law triangle, I would say. So um, I wonder how would you um, interpret this paradigm shift if there is any, because this slide, I really like that this development is theoretically still relevant. I also think so, so I would be very happy if you would elaborate a little more on that. Um, and for this, um, for this evil within, um, I'm just coming from this um, um, panel discussion about, about this ethics and all these ethics commissions, ethics codes, um, and all these constant forms and everything which are there to uh, control the uh, evil within anthropology. But these are, these are not coming necessarily from the discipline itself, but they are coming from outside. Um, and I'm curious what you think about these two, because they are crippling anthropology somehow. Because in my opinion, it's quite um, self-reflexive, could be better, uh, and compared to development, which is definitely not self-reflexive at all, um, it doesn't have this kind of, um, 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 it's not open to this kind of interventions from outside development, and it's, it is powerful, so, yeah. Okay, so let's, can we have, uh, you're just responding to that question, then we'll take two questions, one in the middle and one at the back, and then we'll Oh, thank you, that's uh, really interesting and useful. Um, I mean, when you said the critique from anthropology wasn't heard by development, I'm not entirely sure I agree with you. I think that some of the critiques were heard by development in some quarters. And of course, we're talking about vast areas of practice and you know, huge institutions, which um, of many, many people are part of those institutions. But I think one of the critiques from anthropology that was heard back in the 80s was, um, the, was from feminist anthropology which actually did lead to a whole new area of practice, which is um, the, um, the area that you've got your PhD in, gender and development, is not just a field of study, it's also a field of practice. 
Um, so uh, I'm not entirely sure that anthropology hasn't affected development uh, in terms of the development industry. I completely agree with you about humanitarianism as being a new kind of entrance onto uh, maybe anthropology is having an affair with humanitarianism whilst development is... I can't get away from this couple stuff. You know, um, humanitarianism is kind of flirting with development, with um, anthropology whilst development's um, putting out the rubbish. Who knows? Anyway. Um, uh, in terms of ethics, yes, it's a two-way street, and ethics can um, come from the outside. And I think that, I mean, my only response to that in this forum would be that we need to be aware of the ways in which our practices are not just shaped from within, but also from much more, um, broader contexts. So if I apply for a grant, then the grant giver will um, also have codes of ethics that I have to adhere to. I was just, uh, I was thinking as, as Katie was answering that one, I thought this was slightly more a question for you in, in any case, but one of the um, things that sort of struck me is the, the continuous lure of the development industry in all of its guises and the humanitarian industry, despite how critical PhD students can be in writing up their anthropology dissertations. I myself know many people who've gone into consultancies at the World Bank yet have written these, you know, hundreds of pages uh, of, of, of critical work on what the kind of the World Bank's done. I think there's something in terms of, like, the evil within uh, uh, discursively and analytically uh, that is still quite easily dropped under conditions of precarity. And that's and not to, the, to the, like, the blame of anyone, but I think there's something to be explored there. Oh, yes, it's. I don't think we're just forced into working in development because we're hard up. I think there's another pull, and I think there is a... I mean, certainly in my experience of my earlier work, there was a pull to do good. And we still have... Many of us have a belief that... I mean, development, however constituted, whether it's different, but also development is also working with NGOs. It can be a form of activism. I mean, we're talking about development as if it was all the same, which is my fault because of the way I presented the paper. But... Um, I think the pull is, yes, it's great to have a consultancy and earn money, but it's also great to engage at, at a moral level. Thank you. So there was something here in the middle. Uh, yes, and then at the back. You can see the hand raised. You can get the mic to the cheap hand. Uh, John Glenn, University of Manchester. Um, I wonder if we could talk a bit more about why it is that we've, we've come back to discussing decolonization in this moment. I mean, this is not a new project. I mean, this move, in, even in Britain, I mean, goes back clearly to the, to the 1970s, it's been endlessly replicated. And it's not just a problem for anthropology because new versions of de I mean, something like Boaventura Santos and the epistemologies of the state south, there are constantly new versions of this same process. Are we still talking about this now because we didn't do it properly, we didn't take it seriously, or because of the way we tried to do it? Many of us as kind of white white boys who look like posted children for the Hitler youth in departments that didn't have enough people who weren't white in them. Um, or, or is that entirely the wrong approach? I mean, should we not be learning about decolonization from the poor people of colour that we do field work in? I mean, I do field work with some very undocile subjects who talk a lot about reparations for colonialism talk a lot about more radical approaches to dealing with racism in thought, and if I make a mistake, they accuse me of treating them like lab rats in a laboratory. Right, so I mean, that's a, a kind of powerful critique. So I wonder if you could reflect a bit more on that. So we'll just hold that question. We'll take the mic to the back, four or five rows back from Uh, uh, my name is Zaman. I'm from uh, Sussex, University of Sussex. Uh, I'd like to thank Cathy uh, Gardner for, his for her wonderful talk. Uh, but just my comment would be maybe a bit related to the, the previous comment. Uh, 
Uh, to me, uh, it was uh, a story of anthropology uh, from UK perspective or broadly Western perspective. And uh, a cut, quote unquote, Western. I mean, anthropology, definitely, we all know that indeed it has, as a discipline, emerged in, in, in Europe and in the West. But that doesn't mean that it belongs to Europe. Uh, anthropology has a different uh, track uh, and different pathways in non Western countries. And uh, they, uh, I mean, th there's a different story. The, the story of anthropology. Uh, in non-Western countries is different and it has uh, uh, like a whole tradition of uh, anthropology at home, of course, we, we all know. Uh, and uh, I, I just, uh, I, I work with anthropologists from Sudan, I work with uh, anthropologists from Bangladesh, and, and I see how they, they use the tools that they have learned from the colonial masters and using it maybe against them and, uh, and, and they're using this, the huge potential of anthropological methods in a different way. But we would not be, uh, we unfortunately will not hear these stories. And, and if we see this whole audience, uh, their whole structural uh, barriers that we would never hear the stories of the non-Western trajectory of anthropology, but it has a different potential as well. Uh, so I think we probably need to be critical about that also. Anthropology has a different story. Uh, just an, as an anecdote, I, I, I'd like to point out that, I mean, uh, when I received this... Uh, so, no, not, not anecdote, but related to this, co uh, this conference. Actually, you raised a really important point. Can you just take that one point up now? Right, so, okay then. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, I guess I'll take the I'll take the the first one. Um, probably, yeah. Really, I think I, yeah, completely would uh, agree with the things that you raised there. Important points. I, why is why now, um, and what has gone wrong in the past? As uh, the kind of decolonizing literature has shown two ways in which the movement kind of didn't emerge as well as it could have, and that was being absorbed into university spaces. Um, in a, and this sort of the main language of uh, uh, anti or sort of anti-racist activism played out in uh, a, a language of diversity, and 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 filtered into um, HR departments to try and kind of tackle this without going to the uh, deeper causes. And the other side is a kind of language of trauma. Um, around this where um, even the, because the media would pick up on particular issues of like what's it like for um, one black student studying under a Rhodes Foundation or whatever at, uh, at Oxford, how has that been for them, you know, kind of personalising the story itself again, not kind of putting the um, focus on the ways in which it um, needs to be attended. And the other thing I would say, like, we live in increasingly, in the UK, increasingly nationalistic times. Uh, with fascists on the streets and questions being raised publicly about who has a right to what. Uh, and that filters through all of our public institutions and I think that that is one thing that's definitely kind of uh, bringing this question to the fore a little more. And anthropology's role of, uh, as, of a kind of um, in this could potentially be addressing the repugnant way in which race is dealt with in the mainstream media. Mm -hmm. One thing I would, I'd kind of add to that as an, as an aside. Yeah. Um, yes, I agree with you. Luke. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, I think I completely agree with what Luke's just said on that question. I think it's a really, in a really interesting and important question. Um, I mean, I think there's a sort of cynical way of answering it, or maybe a pragmatic way of answering it from the point of view of somebody who's been a head of department. Um, quite a while and then there's also because there are lots of reasons for things not ever just one I mean I think the, the pragmatic the pragmatics of it is partly that anthropo not just anth academic departments have to listen to their students now we have to have happy students if we don't they'll fill out the NSS and then we're you know and then we're history so yes we have to we have to have student approval that's one reason um, secondly of course is the fact that um, as Luke as you said um, anthropology faculty tend to be very um, on board with these uh, movements in the first place. But I think maybe the much bigger 
question which thinks, which uh, makes us think about the kind of moral context, is that we're living in a time of, I mean, not maybe not quite despair, but we're living in very, very dark days. And I, f I think that the reasons that decolonizing catches fire the uh, within departments such as, you know, within our own department at the LSE, is because it's an act of hope. And it's actually something that we can do something about. You know, we can rename a library. We can, we can change the way that we teach. And, um, and so I, I think that is part of that broader context. I think it's also it's interesting that decolonizing now is very much a bottom-up, uh, largely student-led movement, rather than something that comes from you know, a theoretical move within anthropology, which is reflected upon um, you know, uh, authorial practices, for example. So to turn to um, the second fantastic, really important um, question, um, Zaman, um, from Sussex, um, I completely agree. The reason that I, I, I very deliberately made my paper about British anthropology was because I wanted to be specific and not generalise, and that's where I have experience. But I would think that we absolutely need to um, hear these stories of non-Western anthropologies, and you know, um, let's make space for that. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. So we've got two more questions, then followed by answers. And I think after that, it's an additional three or four questions. So let's uh, keep going. Thank you. For at least 250 years, anthropology has done good by celebrating the other as somebody with humanity. For less than 60 years, international development has tried to do good by making the others into us. Could you explain to me why it is the latter that is getting all the power, the wealth, <coughs> and the force that you have been describing in your paper? Thank you. And no school of social research. I, I'm not too sure what to say. I don't. I don't think you were here yesterday, were you? No, I didn't think so. Um, I'm not sure that couples research actually does it for understanding development, and that colonialism alone doesn't do it for joining the two on the couch. Um, there are other bedfellows that we haven't even talked about that I find extraordinary that it's been narrowed down to this sort of, you know, we have to reflect on ourselves. Development has been intimately tied to counterinsurgency throughout its history and before its history, before it was called development before we had a CIA, counterinsurgency and development have been intimately related. So is anthropology, so I'm not, not putting that aside. But I, I, I find it strange that, that we have this generic category of development as if it, it's always been wanting to really do good and really be humanitarian. It's not at all what its intention was in any of the papers on it in any of the archive on it. It was intimately tied World Bank to making sure certain kinds of governments had to be, had to be um, ousted out, where massacres were allowed and were not condemned but were condoned, unless you're writing that history. And that is the murderous history that Ashield talks about of liberalism. Then I don't know what, what story we're really telling here. It's much too narrow for me. I mean, I think the first question is actually answered by the second question, if you like. Um, the first question, why is it uh, that development has all the power, is because 
um, as uh, Anne has said, development is uh, canon in some of its iterations be deeply evil and it is um, absolutely uh, embedded in the uh, continuation of global inequalities, um, counterinsurgency, etc. So, I mean, and I agree, I, I, I agree and uh, it's a kind of, um, it's a simplification to talk about development as one thing, clearly. Um, so, all I can say really is I agree. I think, I mean, I'm in the same boat. I think that, yeah, you're right, the first, uh, so the second question does answer the first. And um, I guess I, I kind of tried to touch on the, the role, but only, like, lightly when referring to Evans Pritchard spying on the newer as a sort of explicitly funded project uh, to do with the uh, Azande shrines and relocating people. But um, I think absolutely, in any fuller in any fuller version of this would completely. This is central to the um, counterinsurgency, is central to the colonial project that still endures. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you very much. So let us carry on. There was a question over here. The mic is just on its way. Uh... Thank you. Um, thanks very much. Yeah, I'm Olivia. Um, yeah, it was just sort of a brief comment on the idea of the desk collapsing into the field and I know there's a kind of, there was a discussion on that as well which I didn't actually attend but um, I guess my reaction when you said that was like you know what are, why are anthropologists sort of panicking about this when for a lot of anthropologists who maybe do do this kind of anthropology at home it's a sort of reality or I mean what we learn is I mean I, I'm a Pacific anthropologist and there are many indigenous scholars in the Pacific who talk about the fact that they are always accountable to their communities and uh, have a responsibility to be accountable to their communities before they necessarily think about, you know, the, um, their kind of anthropological responsibility. So the idea that we should go far away and then come back to our desks and have this kind of safety of distance to write critically about our interlocutors seems like quite a privileged uh, perspective when, for a lot of people, that's a reality of being an anthropologist if, if you, if you want to do work at home. So just a comment. Uh, thanks so much. I'm, I'm a little bit perplexed by this idea that this decolonizing pressure or theory is, is A, new, and B, coming from students. I mean, we have had, I think, it, you know, we could say maybe it's an Anglophone thing, but actually for a very long time, indigenous scholars in Australia, in the US, black scholars, uh, queer scholars, feminist scholars were mentioned, but I think it's worth noting that, as you say, feminist anthropology had an impact, but queer anthropology, uh, black anthropology, uh, indigenous anthropology has been speaking loudly and clearly. The issue of not listening or cutting off before we get to the anecdote is maybe different from saying it's not happening. So I'm a little bit, um, I'm a little bit disturbed by that idea and I think that there is a lot of literature out there and maybe we can think about that footnotes point and say, well, who are we keeping in the footnotes? And who then are we leaving out? Okay, so we're gonna take your questions and then there's a question in the middle. There's a door man right there, we'll go to Anthony in a moment. Oh, should I just dive in on the on the last point then? I'd say I'd say absolutely. And I was thinking um, uh, earlier on the train on the way here of um, like uh, uh, Kath Weston's work on the LGBT community in Southern California or San Francisco um, as being kind of um, like one of the, never 30 years old, but like one of the like real early elucidations of decolonizing literature that's read outside uh, and inside anthropology today as well as kind of, but often, yeah, and I was thinking to myself that actually that, that kind of discussion has got forgotten a little bit. So I would agree. I mean, yeah. Um of course, decolonizing isn't just coming from students. I was referring to the, uh, the question really about why now, John Gledhill's question about why now, and I was talking about specific movements within academic departments, i.e. You know, within LSE, for example, in which that movement came from the students. 
as a, as a movement, the decolonising, absolutely, you're completely right. So thank you for kind of m helping me make that corrective. Um, in terms of the desk collapsing into the field, I mean, that's not my phrase. That's a phrase from um, David Moss. Um, I, completely, I completely agree, yes. I think that um, it, what David and Ed Simpson in his piece are referring to, though, is uh, a new era in which objection seems to be happening much more, because partly because of the digitalization of knowledge, so that people that... Um, you know, anthropologists have done fieldwork with, can immediately access their work and then they can object and even actually sue the uh, writer or, or for a libel or something if they, if they don't agree with what's been written, which is what the point of Ed Simpson's piece was. Okay, so there's uh, at least two questions all around that paper right? Let's start with uh, Shubashi in the middle. Thank you. Uh, my question is in the spirit of trying to figure out a nomenclature for world anthropologies, if it were to be, and what would that be? And uh, within a disciplinary framework, what is the disciplinary language that we can have for something like that? Because I wonder within British academia or American academia, how many departments of South Asia, Latin America, Caribbean studies, East Asian studies are there? And if we are willing to sort of do away with them in a disciplinary framework, I would love to use that money to figure out an Anglo-Saxon department in India or like a North American WASP studies in, in, the, in South Asia. That just hasn't happened. And I doubt in the near future we are there. So in the spirit of decolonization, within a disciplinary framework, what could be, what could be a possible worlding anthropology if it were at all? Hi. Um, Thanks for that. Thanks for both the talks. Um, I was thinking we need to get away from this metaphor of the house because I do think it's rather constricting. Uh, I teach at Goldsmith, as some of you will know, um, and we are more into polyamory and things like that, so we don't do the house and the relationship and the mortgage. Um, but coming back to the kind of more sinister um, questions that you have asked about the, the histories that we are trying to reflect on and dismantle. I do think that one of the issues that we are facing is that there's a difference between thinking about the knowledge production process and actually about what we are also engaged in and is using a kind of, you know, using this in paraphrase uh, is actually people making. You know, the, the idea of teaching the students that we are, um, um, have, been, have been doing for such a long time, which is not necessarily the same. The two are related, but they are not necessarily the same. And I do think that at least in some universities, like my own, these questions are much more right now about teaching and the people-making process, so to speak, right? Um, to come to this idea, to, to reflect on the idea of what does it mean to uh, grow up and graduate in a world that we are facing right as it is right now, where development may not be an option for everybody, um, partly because of the histories of our recruitment of middle-class white students, etc. pp, and then asking ourselves what does that mean for the knowledge production process. So on the, on the first question, I think that um, one of the really exciting kind of elements of uh, Professor Allen's work uh, is his sort of description of the exodus of academics out of anthropology departments to launch more radical programs from, uh, from uh, area studies or, or black cultural studies or whatever like that, um, and the kind of uh, making public of anthropology and also making anthropology kind of uh, more engaging in public fora. Um, and I think that's really something to, to think of if, as if we think of ourselves as creating a quite elitist, enclosed, uh, insular discipline as well. Like, as frustrating as it might be when uh, whoever talking head pops up on the television and self-identifies as an anthropologist and you're like, oh, hang on, um, actually, maybe, maybe a bit more of that um, would be kind of uh, a generous uh, collaborative endeavor as much as it may uh, may hurt um, in in um, response to uh, Henrika's question um, I think that the kind of like one of the things that Katie kind of 
went through in her paper, if I may, is the kind of critiques of um, colonialism in writing culture that were um, critiques about writing and critiques about representation. And what we're, what we're into now is a kind of new arena of thinking through our teaching practice um, where you can have fairly um, white faculty and non-white, massively diverse uh, student body and engaging with these com like conversations that are uh, not just about race as uh, an analytical trope, as a lived experience as well. I think that that is what's kind of being worked through at the moment in our, in our sorts of discussions. <laughs> I'd have to think about it. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I don't have a huge amount to say about that question right now. I think it's incredibly interesting and really important. Um, I think it would be wonderful to have um, scholars from across the world coming and doing field work in Britain, for example. Um, that seems very hard to, to make that happen because of funding, visas, etc. And it seems that, I mean, the place where I've done my work is Bangladesh. And most Bangladeshi scholars that I know and Bangladeshi PhD students that I've had have done their projects in Bangladesh and not in the UK. So, I mean, I would love to see a re, you know, a repointing of that whereby um, the gaze is turned. But um, for the reasons to do with um, career trajectories in Bangladesh and what's expected um, by the, the universities that are funding um, people to come to the UK, the idea, you know, the basic... Uh, focus usually is that they need to do their field, field work in Bangladesh, not in the UK. So, yeah. Luke, any word on that particular question? I was really interested. I mean, for, for me, uh, it's kind of like just a just another way of gathering knowledge around a, a centre, a centre, right? That's going to be rife with its with its own risks and questions about kind of the relations of production behind it. So I don't know. If how much stock at this moment to put into ideas about world, and, world anthropology? Okay. Can I make one tiny statement? I feel, I, I feel as though my comment was made sort of flattened out because you both agree with me. Okay. And I'm not sure you do agree with me. Uh -huh. And <laughs> what I was trying to say is that I think in the way you presented this, You've made the history complicated, but the contemporary, somewhat benign, in the way of development and anthropology, well, we're really in the same boat, we really got to think about what we're doing. But the fact remains, there are development agencies that are absolutely dedicated to counterinsurgency in a way that I don't think anthropologists would imagine themselves. And I think young people who are coming into the field should really have some strategy for understanding what they may be getting into, what they may be supporting, mm -hmm. what certain kinds of government-funded, and that's not all, but some government-funded agencies are doing and what their goals are in terms of counterinsurgency and in terms of making sure that whatever left they imagine as the adversary um, is demolished. And I just think it's important, it, it isn't as benign I, as, as I fear, I fear you conveyed it to a younger audience who might say, well, I can do either one because we're all in a, in a panel. Um, that's not what I meant, actually. I mean, I don't think development is benign. I teach development from a very critical viewpoint. Um, I, I think it's, imp it's impossible not to. I think, um, you know, development as a project of uh, modernization and change and economic growth is, I mean, counterinsurgency, yes, but the broader project of growth, for growth's sake, look what it's doing to the planet. Completely. I mean, we need to deconstruct that and attack it politically. I completely agree with you. However, when you if one teaches development, which I have done in the past, there's you know audiences of young people who desperately want to do good in the in the world, and so finding a path through the critique, the anthropological uh, critique of, of development, which is an I mean, it's more than important. It's you know, it's central. Um, and yet, leaving 
students with that and not in a place of despair but with hope I think is something that one has to do in one's pedagogic uh, you know um, uh, strategies and I don't think development is just one thing I think development is lots of things so then we get to the question of post development we get to the questions of redistribution rightful share James Ferguson's you know new work we get to questions of what would a world of improvement look like without this idea of development so um, uh, by for reasons of uh, you know a short presentation, um, maybe I did present development as some kind of benign guy or you know a person who is hanging around the house. But um, that's certainly not how I actually understand development. But as Dan, you know, you um, wrote to me, development is not one thing. There's also ideas of sustainable development. There are um, NGOs working for rights, which might be um, glossed as development. I'm sorry if I flattened out your question. Okay, let's take the final three questions. So there's one, and then two, three, and three. Okay, let's start here. You've got the mic. Uh, thank you. So I have a, a comment and then a question and then maybe another comment if I can remember it because I've been holding it for so long. Um, I just wanted to reference uh, the comment that was made earlier about the need to tell stories of anthropology from different parts of the world. Um, and I think that yes, while we talk about anthropologies of resistance in different parts of the world, it's also important to tell stories of how the relationship between academics and communities and academics and development practitioners are also framed with caste and class and religion, religious-based inequality. So these are not romantic stories. They're not, it's not as if we in the global south, quote unquote, are not othering. Um, so I think we need to tell those stories as well instead of it being a binary of sorts. The question I had was, um, I kept thinking about this during um, Professor Gardner's uh, talk. We haven't talked about the big F, which is fieldwork. You know, what happens in fieldwork when the anthropologist meets the development practitioner, and of course acknowledging that these are not homogenous figures. Um, and I say this as somebody who worked in the development sector in India and South Asia and then moved into academia, and I find myself increasingly uncomfortable when academics critique uh, the development uh, sector, but at the same time use development organizations to gain access to the field and then go away and critique them. But at, you know, then there's a footnote, and I've done it myself. This is not this is not about you know sort of projecting to other people or complaining about others and saying that no, you know, we're we're talking about power structures. We're not talking about individual organizations. But this tension between the anthropologist figure and the development practitioner figure, we, especially during field work, we need to talk about this more. And I'd love to hear from both of you about how you've negotiated this tension in your own work. I think that would be really valuable. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Um, I have a sort of two-pronged question that kind of addresses the first comment from the gentleman from Manchester, but also um, thinks about the, uh, what Anne St Stoller was saying yesterday in her talk about the tenses we use for words and the ways in which the colonial past is actually always in the present. And it's a mistake to think of these kinds of things as past. Um, and in your talk, Luke, you briefly mentioned um, decolonized as a sort of potential past tense thing. Um, and I know that why at this moment, so I'm from South African and I come from South Africa, and I think it's important to remember that one of the key things that happened at the beginning of this decolonizing movement was firstly that it was the university that was being asked to decolonize and not just anthropology, but secondly that this was coming very strongly from South Africa through the Roads Must Fall movement with Caesar and Porfu Porf Walsh bringing that to Oxford and that we must ask who is this generation that is speaking. It's sort of the first South African generation of black South Africans that were able to be educated outside of apartheid and are then able to stand up and speak towards the university um, and what it is doing. And so I, I wanted to ask, um, they say, a lot of those students that I speak to, that we should never believe that we can decolonize anthropology or the university, but that we should see it as decolonizing for as long as the university exists, it still is embedded in its colonial structures and therefore using the past tense or ever thinking that we've done the job and therefore the job is over is actually massively detrimental and therefore we need to consistently keep this as a present tense project essentially. 
Thank you very much, uh, Helen Lambert from University of Bristol. Thank you very much, Katie, for a fantastic talk. And since you seem to be getting some stick from uh, your psychoanalytic approach, I wanted to <laughs> just try and push it a little bit further and point out that one of the things that projective identification, of course, does for the projector, I suppose, um, is to um, remove the responsibility from them so we uh, can, as it were, critique development and development's bad habits without having to own the consequences. And I think that is a really important point to be aware of. Um, I guess the following question, though, is um, from my experience from kind of a working in global health arenas, the thing that makes me really uncomfortable about um, working with people who want to kind of do stuff in the world from other disciplines is, is it relates, I think, to your point about the shared origins of anthropology and development about in, in people becoming modern. I think it's not so much that as the requirement of intervention and prediction which makes it difficult for anthropology because all of our training teaches us how complex everything is. And I think there's a kind of inherent disciplinary reluctance to kind of throw our cards on the table in any particular direction. And if we want to not sit outside, as Laura suggested, the development, uh, the, the people who are influencing things and have power, albeit that, of course, the development may be many, many things, um, there's nothing stopping us from getting a share of the 1.5 billion Global Challenges Research Fund, but we may need to say that we're going to do something with that money. So I just wondered if you could reflect on that. So much stuff there to um, respond to. Um, to start with the first uh, question about uh, encounters with developers during field work, I. Um, Yes, I agree, those are interesting encounters and the, the kind of guilt that one might feel, you know, then going back, having worked with an NGO, as many, as you say, many people, I'm sort of looking at the audience, I couldn't, with the mic, I can't actually even see who's, who's um, speaking, I can't remember who asked that question, but going, you know, having getting entrance into the field work via an NGO and then going back and just critiquing it, maybe that is a fairly um, familiar, uh, problem, I guess. In my own field work, um, the, the book that I've uh, published on uh, an oil company, uh, Chevron, a, a gas extraction company, working with those guys and the way that they told stories about development and then deconstructing those stories for me was an absolute joy because um, the kind of hypocrisy of what they were doing um, was easy to reveal in my field work. So that's a kind of, um, I guess that's an easy one because they are a multinational, huge billion dollar oil um, company which uh, does do a great deal of harm in the world. Um, but I agree with you that at another level these, these encounters can be very difficult. Um, Luke, maybe you should respond to the point about the colonial past is always in the, is always in the present and decolonizing is an onward process. I, can, I mean, I've often, I, think I completely agree with that. Helen, um, uh, one of the problems with working at, with developers or people who are interested in changing things is the interventions and the nature of the interventions. I think that's absolutely right. Even if you might, you know, agree with some of the aims, which might be for, I don't know, uh, let's say, um, literacy or whatever it is, or giving people better health care, the techniques or fixing of problems is always too simplistic for us anthropologists and I think often leaves us feeling very uneasy. There's always a simplification. There's always a boiling down of complexity. And in fact, to go back to some of the earlier comments on gender and development, I think that is clearly what happens. So early feminist anthropology theories of gender were taken within the aid industry to create the field which is gender and development and then turned into a whole range of simplifications involving this kind of, you know, the cliché, the trope of female empowerment, which just boils down to often training um, or membership of so many women on so many local committees and so on and so forth. And there, the anthropologist show, throws up 
their hands in horror at how something complex has been turned into something simple. And that's another reason why developments in anthropology are very different. Um, okay, we might share things in our past, but actually in the way that we approach the world and the things that we want to say about the world, we are completely different. So um, again, to go back to your point, Anne, anthropology and development, um, uh, that, I mean, they're never going to get married. You know, <laughs> sorry to be, you know, a bit boring and trad about that. Okay, so um, very quickly on the, f on, the f on the first point, I currently have no uh, outstanding lawsuits against me uh, regarding uh, things. That, whether that means I'm do doing what I'm doing right or wrong, I don't know. I leave that to you. Um, on the second question, the, uh, the past tense of, of that came up that the past tense of uh, decolonized. Um, I did a quick I did a quick uh, word search to see where I might may have slipped up and accidentally used it in my. Uh, piece uh, and it came up. It came up once, which was uh, in referring to um, what is not what 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 is not decolonized um, in terms of which could have easily been turned to a, a present tense continuous verb. Um, but it's but it's actually paying attention, or purposefully paying attention to the fact that something uh, can't necessarily be decolonized in the therapeutic processes of the possessed as well in. So I would agree. But anyway, enough of my blathering. I think one of the best, in terms of working with uh, students on this, uh, one of the best kind of elaborations of what the decolonizing uh, project means within the university setting, the one that really stuck with me, one that I would uh, leave with uh, now, came from Dahlia uh, Gabriel, who says, it means that we dig where we stand. Uh, and I thought that worked quite nicely. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, as well as thanking the speakers, if you just have, as you just have done, I'd also, on behalf of the speakers, like to thank you for your very rich uh, and thought-provoking uh, inputs into the session. Thank you so much.